Hello and welcome to our little studio in Germany. Also, if my German is not perfect, I have a native English speaker as a guest. It's Cara <laughs> St. Louis from America, and she's been writing a book about chemtrails and geoengineering. It's called Crosswalks. Mm -hmm. And you see it. And it's a brilliant book, actually. It's a novel, and it's written so brilliantly <coughs> that I really want to. <laughs> stress it out yes. because uh, it's so profound knowledge about aviation and about the background or, and the structures of the military industrial complex that's behind it and the thinking of the pilots and <coughs> the people who are involved with it. Um, can you tell me first um, how, how did you come into the topic? What happened? The, sure. the mother was killed sure. away? Sure, and the more I talk about it, the the more um, fascinating it is to me to actually take a take stock of the scenario how this happened. July, I, I say now that July 10th, 2010, I was just an ordinary person going about my business. I lived in Seacoast, Maine. I have three children. I do what I do, um, going about my life. Then on July 11th, 2010, a Sunday morning, a beautiful Sunday morning, my mother was walking to church less than a block from where she lived, and just as she was about to get to the other side of the crosswalk, she was run down by a fellow in a van, and she died uh, several hours later, surrounded by her family um, in the hospital. Um, and that sounds like a very tragic event all on its own. Um, it could have been considered just an unbelievable accident, a terrible twist of fate. But in fact, it wasn't very long before I, as her daughter, started to wonder about certain things. This was a sense that I had um, an intuition that maybe something more needed to be looked at here. And my mother had worked as, a, my mother initially had been a music teacher, but she changed her career halfway through her lifespan, her working lifespan, and she started to work for the U.S. government. Um, when it became interesting to me relative to the accident was that she worked for the Navy. Um, she worked for the Navy in London at the Office of Naval Research as the editor of their fact sheet, which was a collection of um, updates on what the various scientists were doing uh, in terms of research in the Navy and then that fact sheet went, was distributed to other scientists worldwide. So in fact she did have a very high sec security clearance and she uh, was privy to a lot of the things that they were working on and you know maybe she didn't understand every single thing that she came across but certainly she saw them and she was an intelligent woman so much of it had to have gone in and had been understandable. When she, left, uh, when she left London, she went back to Washington. Well, really, it was Virginia, Dahlgren, Virginia, and she worked for Naval Weapons. Um, Surface Weapons, I think, was the name of the, of the division that she worked at. Now, I wasn't really privy to a lot of what she saw because she did have a high security clearance. She really couldn't talk about what she was doing. Then she retired, she moved to Hawaii, and she worked, for, um, she worked for entities who were trying to get military contracts from the government. So she never really left the arena where she was seeing lots and lots of weapons, lots and lots of the most advanced technology available, and working for entities that were trying to get work out of DARPA, mm -hmm. which is... Um, defense, is uh, defense I can't, I actually, I'm not sure right offhand what it stands yeah. for. We all call it DARPA because um, we're all very familiar with what it is and um, it's become an entity, an arm of the military that really works with the most secret, uh, high-tech, um, scary mm -hmm. sorts of technologies mm -hmm. and it's all very secret and they have a huge budget. Anyway, um, so she never really left that arena. After she was killed, like I said, I did have something of an intuition that I really needed to look into this more. When she was working at the Office of Naval Research, one of the scientists, whom I will never name because I really ought not to, um, and it's all in the public record anyway, um, if anyone wanted to find out yeah, more about this. So a lot of um, work, so. mm -hmm. One of the scientists was a specialist, was an operation paperclip scientist, and was a specialist in atmospheric physics and plasma studies. So when I started looking at that and looking, 
That combined with the death of John Wheeler at the end of 2010, he had worked in similar ways that, that my mother had worked after retiring from the Army and then subsequently working, uh, trying to work on getting contracts for the government with defense contractors, being that liaison with the Pentagon. On December, 20, uh, December 31st, 2010, he was actually found in a dumpster. He'd been killed, and I don't think that that's necessarily ever been investigated fully. The very next day, January 1st, 2011, animals started falling from the sky. We remember that that was sort of the period of time, the very day that we all became aware that huge mass quantities of birds were just dropping from the sky for absolutely mm. no reason. Mm. Fish were washing up on the shore for absolutely no reason, and we were all becoming aware of that. And recently that started happening again, and it, again in even bigger quantities within the last week or two, by the way. I just really? will bring oh, that up. I yeah, didn't know that. that's okay. actually ramped up considerably, and we're, we're seeing that again. This is what started me on the path. July 10th, 2010, I knew absolutely nothing about geoengineering, aerosol engineering, or the colloquial, which is chemtrails. We try not to use that uh, term too much anymore. Um, and July 11th, everything changed for me. My entire world changed from top to bottom because of that event and looking into geoengineering. I knew nothing about it. That's so the accident was the change. The accident point, was yes. the change. And I knew mm. also that because I'm a writer, I needed to write about this. Yeah. That was to definitely, get it off your soul, definitely the sense that I had. And yeah. I had absolutely no idea really what the book was going to end up being in the end. What was it going to need to be? Um, I had a lot of help. And you've, you've been so nice commenting about the technical aspects of the book. That is really largely thanks to... Uh, at the end of several months of research on my part, technical advice by a fellow called Mark McCandlish, who's yeah. extremely uh, active you, you in the United You find him on the States. internet, he has a lot of Well, stuff I did out find there. him on the internet, yes. and that's, that's the interesting thing. Once you start investigating this, you realize you there are... You find a lot. You, you do. It's yeah. not just written. Mm. You, you find that there are a lot of people in the United States, which was the arena I was looking in, who half, well, a handful of people who are talking all the time, who've been doing decades worth of research and now it's all collated and now they're putting it down and they have been relentless about talking about it at great risk to the life and limb honestly because there was a period of time up until a good maybe a year a year and a half ago where it really was dangerous to talk about this mm -hmm. it really was and now so many people are talking about it millions of people are talking about it that's becoming more and more safe so we are living in exciting times things are yeah. coming out but yeah. um, let me uh, talk maybe what the, the topic really is it's geoengineering and maybe we c show, can show some nice clips we got from some german guy i think it's nico hacker or something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he had some beautiful time-lapse uh, pictures so you see how the sky develops over the d yes. course of the day and you see that the one is one plane with a you think it's a contrail and then there's another and the contrails don't <coughs> disappear <coughs> as they usually would and after a while you have a crisscross mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. pattern and then the sky goes like in a milky uh, way yes. and you see the development quite good in this time that pictures we show. Thank God there have been people who've been keeping track of this over Absolutely, time so that yes. we have evidence. There's lots the science of is irrefutable now, Joe. It's there. Yeah, but there's people looking up and saying, well, well that's there's more air traffic now than it has been 20 years ago. Well, that's right, but it's not what's happening there. Right, right. And you can see the difference, of course. You have the contrails that are usually dissolving after a certain uh, why behind the plane and mm -hmm. you see that it moves with the plane mm -hmm. but you have those stripes that don't disappear yes. and they're different of course. Yes. What are they? Well those are nanoparticles of heavy metals that are being dropped on us basically that's what that is. Um, you're absolutely right we live in a condition now where we really aren't seeing blue skies anymore over a period of time we now see white skies. We have what's called a whiteout. And no, they're not contrails. Contrails develop at very high altitudes with very little moisture in the air, and they disappear very quickly. The clouds that we're the clouds, and I use that term loosely, um, that we are looking at develop at low altitudes, and they require a tremendous amount of moisture. 
They are not like any clouds that we've ever experienced in our lifetimes, for sure. But the younger people who grow up they with that sky, they think it's normal. They it's think the sky it's that we grew up with, it, but we didn't grow up with that. Yes. The elder people may it's, maybe remember. It's very important, yes, yes, to point that out to yes. these to to thirty age thirty and younger, for sure. These programs have demonstrably been around for about six decades now, but it's really been in my adult lifetime and and probably in the last 10 years or so that I've noticed the change in the skies. The skies aren't blue anymore, right? Never have I seen clouds that, that begin as long 90 mile lines in the sky and become grids across the sky and then disperse. And obviously something's dripping down from these clouds and they have a huge hang time. And if you, some people will say it happens at the same time every day as well, that there's a there's a schedule to it in certain areas. Regardless, it's not natural. Yeah, it's not definitely. natural. And it is a fact that our, in the United States, NASA has put out a new uh, cloud chart, a chart of cloud identification to be distributed into the schools that have these so-called new clouds amongst them. But I'm here, these are not clouds. These are not clouds, these are nanoparticles, these are what I have recently learned is, are called ionizable metallic ions. Let us start maybe with aluminum that's mm -hmm. uh, supposed to be in it. Um, uh, they have an effect on the trees actually and if th there's fires um, then mm -hmm. the fire uh, well, department we has problem too. We definitely can start with the trees and this, this is something I this is something I learned recently these particular facts by listening to Dane Wigington, who's been very vocal this year, about his immediate concerns about uh, methane in the at atmosphere and what geoengineers are uh, preparing to do about that. Um, but if you want to talk about the trees, we can talk about the arboreal forests in, nor in the Northwest Pacific and in Siberia that are dying. 70% of those trees are on their way out. These are the lungs of the planet, okay? And this is because of the metals being dropped. When a tree encounters aluminum, which seems to be the lion's share of what the nanoparticles are that are being mm -hmm. dropped on us, it will actually shut itself off. It will, in a way, commit suicide because it does, it's trying to protect its DNA from this bioavailable aluminum, so it turns itself off. All right, aluminum that hits the soil affects the trees as well because it sterilizes the soil. It kills everything in the soil, the microbes. And that leaves space for things like fungus. Now, ordinarily, fungus would be a part of the natural world. It's how trees decay and become hummus, and it becomes part of that cycle. But right now, we've got a soil that's sterile, and so it's, it's playing host to serious seriously high levels of fungus, they're also contributing to killing the trees that are already very weakened. And also, this is the fungus that you find in, in the world um, is showing itself up in humans because it's counter to life, obviously. It's a decay entity. And fungal sinusitis in, in human beings is epidemic right now. Mm -hmm. Most people yeah. don't realize that. Yeah. So when, um, when we talk about the trees, this is really an actually an excellent example of the kind of loop that we're in right now where the scientists, scientists behind the geoengineering programs are, making, are destroying living entities and then bringing in what they would call solutions, right? Mm. So one of the things that I learned recently that I was very, I was very upset to learn was that one of the things that the USDA in the United States has approved is, um, this was in 2010 as well, which appears to be a big year, um, was uh, rolling out genetically engineered trees, which the state will plant, mm -hmm. and they will plant them where they feel they're necessary to be planted. Um, and I guess what their logic is, is this that instead of stopping the geoengineering that's killing the trees, they're just going to replace the dead trees with more science. <laughs> Okay, that's, so, that's but the thing, about, the thing about these genetically engineered trees, Joe, is that they're sterile. They mm. don't reproduce. They don't harbor birds. They don't harbor life of any kind, all right? They're absolutely dead trees. They're living, but they have no ability to regenerate. Like we have with all the uh, plants, we, we 
what the happened in the garden with the flowers. And with, exactly, mm -hmm. with the seeds. And in essence, what they're doing is separating us from our abilities and the planet's ability to recreate itself, yeah. to bring life, to be alive, and to bring life when they do things like this. There really is a, a price to pay for those kinds of efforts. And I, Dane Wigington has said this year, and I absolutely agree with him, that the primary thing for us to do right now is to make them stop doing what they're doing. Yeah. One of the things that happens is we get very distracted arguing the fine points or arguing whether it's actually happening. Well, the science is there. It's absolutely irrefutable. And the data is there thanks to the people who've been gathering this data for decades. Okay? So what we don't need to do is continue to distract ourselves by arguing the fine points because they really count on us doing yeah. that. And they Let's can do divide whatever and conquer, they want. and we say, "Oh, are you sure it's a contra? No, it's a contra. No, it's not a camp." Mm -hmm. And we talk right. about that, and we're not sure, and so exactly. um, nothing is happening. And we have to s really say, "Stop it!" Because you're destroying this planet. I mean, I'm <laughs> not talking a lot like this, but we have to talk like this because they are destroying this planet. Yes, and they're very. Dane has pointed out, and several other people have pointed out this year that they're getting very desperate because. They've created feedback loops on the planet that are really interfering with the natural cycles. It's not just a matter of, I mean, decades ago this started as, a, as an attempt to control the weather. Well, controlling the weather appears to be a human need, a human desire. We've been doing it since the Mayans. I mean, trying to okay. make it rain, trying, you know, yeah. controlling the weather. But then in the 20th century it became a situation where they wanted to militarize the weather, right? And so now, we, now we're in a situation where the currents, the air currents have been absolutely interrupted and that changes the flow of the currents of water in the oceans. And most people I don't think really realize it, but those currents in the oceans drive the weather. Yeah. They drive the weather. Warm water is going where it should not go. You know, cold water goes where it should not go. Everything is absolutely disrupted right now. Um, Scientifically, it's absolutely irrefutably proven that the ozone layer has been shredded, and it's been shredded by geoengineering. It has absolutely nothing to do with your mother keeping her beehive hairdo up with her hairspray in 1966. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely That's, erroneous. Yeah. Um, it has to do with geoengineering. The ozone is shredded, has been shredded. The ozone can repair itself to a certain extent, but it's not being allowed because they're interfering with every natural cycle everything that the earth could be doing to restore itself. And what Dane says, and I absolutely agree, is that one of the things that needs to happen is we stop, we find out who's doing it, we have it stopped. That's an act of will that's very important for us to take as human beings, to say no, and, and you need to stop, and, and then they stop. That is sort of, a, that's, a, that's an act of will that we need to take as human beings. Because they would say, okay, nobody said something, so exactly. what should we do? Why exactly. should we stop it? Exactly. We, we, because the psychosis that's involved in this seems to be that they're going, especially since there's some desperation involved now, that they're going to keep doing what they do, but they're going to keep doing it at greater, greater and greater levels of intensity, hoping to stop what they've already started. This is really insanity, as mm -hmm. Einstein described it. Yeah. Is it not? Absolutely. Um, yeah. One of the things that Dane's been talking about this year, and I really do want to talk about this briefly, um, is the potential for methane releases because of the melting of the Arctic ice. Well, the debate at that point ends up being, is the Arctic ice actually melting or not? That's where we get stuck. That's where we get stuck. That's mm -hmm. what we're debating. We really don't have the luxury of debating that right now. Yeah. Okay? And at that time, I really had to consider, I have children, and I really had to consider what do I say to my children about this. They're young adults. They, one needs to think about how to talk about these things that change the planet. They have to spend another 70 years, on, hopefully, on the planet, as it's going to be. And I, at that time, had decided, you know, my, my children are here to enact their own destiny. And to me, this feels like an aberration of some sort, it's a, an overlay of evil on the planet. And I, I want my children to make decisions about their future based on their own karma, based on why they came here. And I don't want them making decisions out of fear, which I think is one of the goals of this entire program anyway, to make the planet, fill, to fill the planet with fear. 
However, when I learn about things like the emergency geoengineering forum and, and, and the plans that they're making for the planet, it occurs to me that maybe this is my child's destiny. Maybe this is why they're here, and it certainly is what they're going to have to live in. And so I want to talk to that age group very specifically, late teens and 20s. As if we are being prepared for a future of that kind, and it's really not a fun future, yeah. but all the, the kids, computer kids and gamers are prepared for that. So right. just if we want to uh, know what they are planning actually, what kind of future they have in mind, then look at these games and it's not fun. Right. Um, but you said you have the, those kids and they have diseases all over. I mean, can you talk, you I said we, we are breathing these things in, yeah. it's in the soil, okay, we are eating mm -hmm. it. Um, so what the effects eating, does it have on us? Eating it, yes, and I brought notes which I ordinarily would not do, but I really, I think it's important to make sure that I cover a few things um, while we're doing this. Um, and I can cover it, Joe, and you can cover it because we really are a bridge generation, mm -hmm. okay? It's important for us to talk about these things because yeah. we remember the past and we know it's that not, what's going on yeah. right now is not okay. Yeah. It is not the norm. My, I was born in 1959, which makes me a very much a creature of the 20th century, so I absolutely remember what normal was. Absolutely. My children were, were born in the mid-90s. They are creatures of the 21st century, and so their idea of what's normal has nothing to do, in my opinion, and in fact, with what's natural. What's natural for a human being is health. Yeah. Absolute health. Yeah. When we were kids, we were indestructible, and, and that's just really what it was. Absolutely. Now children are sick. Children are very sick, and if that's really happened in one generation, it's almost like they're dissolving in a way. I mean, that's really the best way I can, I can think to describe it. Physically, they're sort, just sort of dissolving. They don't know any different. They think it's normal to have all these pathologies that an old person might have at the end of their life, yep. and they're living with it. They're canaries in a coal mine, and let's talk about that because they are walking billboards for what's wrong, what's coming from the sky and how we're being destroyed. So I did make a list of the things that I think that they need to understand are not normal. The symptoms oh, yes. that they have. Yes, some symptoms that they have, okay? Mm -hmm. Healing times for lesions and sores are greatly reduced or they don't heal at all. That, that means our skin has mm. become that affected. Mm. They have cro chronically diseased, decreased, sorry, body temperatures. There's mm -hmm. O2 deprivation, and the reason there's oxygen deprivation in, uh, cellularly for us is because our cells are now carrying nanoparticles up. There's a lot going on in our bodies that's interfering with our natural processes. Immune systems are absolutely breaking down. We, are, we have immune disorders. This is rampant. This is, we are not healing ourselves. Our, our immune systems are breaking down. Our metabolic systems are absolutely disrupted. Our mitochondrial processes are becoming absolutely disrupted. That's how we take up energy. That's that little cycle, I think they call it the Krebs cycle, where, where energy, you know, at a cellular level, how we use energy. So we're tired all the time. Um, we have extreme dental issues. We have chronic itching and mm -hmm. stinging, and we feel yeah. our skin crawling all mm -hmm. the time. I yeah. know, I, I certainly do that. Yeah. Um, there's alterations to our hair one way or the other. We have extended chronic fatigue. 16 year olds have extended chronic fatigue. This mm. is not normal. I want you guys, I want people to understand That's a that. Criminal. Okay. Mm. okay, I want people to understand that. And abilities to sleep, sleep problems, yeah. okay? That has to do with lots of things, but it's all tied together and it's all unnatural. Joint pain, chronic, unremediated joint pain. Um, Gastrointestinal issues, leaky gut syndrome, GERD, which is the gastrointestinal feedback mm -hmm. that old people used to get. There's such a thing now called pediatric GERD. Children are getting that because their gastrointestinal so systems are breaking down. The disease of the old people old, old usually. People. Yeah. Respiratory yeah. issues. I really want to talk about respiratory issues because now it's the third highest killer in the United States. You get dry coughs. You mm. get walking pneumonia because you're breathing these things in, right? Um, urinary tracts are, infect are infected. And at a cellular level, we are so disrupted and so off balance that oftentimes um, that makes room for things like chlamydia 
um, sugar uh, imbalances and yeast imbalances in our body that we can't deal with because everything is off kilter. Okay, mm -hmm. so these are the things, and you may have you may have thought that I just described some of the symptoms that our grandparents had, yeah. but that's not, not what I'm talking yeah. about. I'm talking sure, about sure. common, mm -hmm. rampant symptoms in children. Okay, it's frightening. and mm -hmm. they don't know that it isn't normal. Aluminum combines with fluoride to cause massive bone problems. Okay, yeah. rickets and bones break easily and things like that. Okay. Some of the other things that they're dropping on us, barium, for example, another uh, very uh, easy, to, easy, easy to detect nanoparticle that's in, that's we're breathing in, that's in the atmosphere. People don't realize that barium is 10,000 times more toxic than lead. Hmm. We have problems with lead. Hmm. Lead we understand. Sure. Lead we got rid of, well, right? Coming out of China with what? lead. And this, uh, what lead? Yeah. But barium is 10,000 times more toxic mm. than that, and they're dropping on it on us. Mm. So tell me what that has to do with the reasons that they supposedly started this program, which is global warming. Mm. What does dropping barium on us and poisoning us in that way have to do with global warming? Okay. These are the sorts of... Mm of logic. This is logic that we need to walk through and really ask ourselves about. Okay? There's also arsenic. There's also cadmium. And may I just say that in the United States there's actually a political party now, um, begun in the great state of Maine, I have to say, because that's where I lived, uh, by Ginger Taylor and some other women who have autistic children. It's called the Canary Party and it has become extremely large and nationwide mm -hmm and it is run by parents. Okay. It's run by parents who know that their children's maladies are vicious and severe and completely debilitating and they are telling us something about the environment that we're living in. All right? That's right. So we need to talk to the people who are being the canaries in the coal mine and that are, that's the young people. We want, I want them to know that this ill health is not normal. Right. Could you also, there's one more aspect of the nanoparticles that is that they, the forces that we, so to say, they want to control us and they can, like, w we have a signature after a while and they can detect mm -hmm. us over the nanoparticles that are in our body and they can do a lot of things with that. They can, they can. This is actually, I think, I would characterize this under the term bioaccumulation. Yeah. Another term that I had no... Uh, knowledge of before my mother died. But yes, bioaccumulation appears to be a big goal. And when you're talking about that, you need to talk about the fibers that yeah. they're dropping on us, not just the nanoparticles. Yeah. There, there are a couple of things that are coming down on us. There are the heavy metals, which are soluble, mm. all right? They call them metallic salts. That means they dissolve. There's some solubility, okay, in the air, mm. yes? And if you... Um, if you, if you have some, some trouble understanding how just that can do damage to the air, think about the smallest amount of salt in a glass of water. How much salt does it take to change a glass of water absolutely and fundamentally? Yeah. Very little, yeah. right? So now we have these dissolvable salts in our atmosphere, yes? We're living in an atmosphere that conducts electromagnetics. It mm -hmm. conducts electricity. Our atmosphere is supposed to be neutral. When we talk about neutral, all we're really doing is identifying the environment in which life thrives. That we call neutral, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Now we have dissolved metals in our atmosphere that conduct, oh, conduct things. Let's just keep it that simple. They conduct things, okay? Um, and we also have things going into our body that cause our bodies, which are mostly water, to be conductive. And so, yes, we, we are affected now by things on the outside that we ought not to be affected by. And the things on the outside can be manipulated to resonate with the things on the inside all the way down to the DNA level. So we're talking about soluble metallic salts being dropped on us at the micron, micron level. When I say micron, we can talk about asbestos, which might be two microns thick, and we all know about asbestos mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. It can get into our lungs. We're not allowed. It's illegal, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. We're talking about submicron stuff that we're breathing in constantly. We also have a segment of what's coming into our body that's represented in fibers. Clifford Carnicom 
in New Mexico has done tons of work on this. And he recently has talked about uh, these fibers in a way that I found very disturbing. It's one of the reasons that I want to talk about it. These are also at the submicron level, okay? There is a phenomenon called Morgellons disease. Morgellons disease, the best, uh, to my best understanding, appears to be a symptomology. It, is, it occurs in people who are rejecting the fibers, meaning they start to come out of your body. All right, and that's Through how we see them. Yeah. They come out, you can see them, you yeah, can measure them. You can see crystals. If you look closely enough, if you use uh, electron microscopes, you can see crystals mm. in them. You can see uh, inner workings. They self-replicate to a certain extent, okay? These are nasty little critters, and some people are rejecting them, thank God, and now we see them, and we can say, so oh my God, what's that? Like a sci-fi movie, um, aliens we, or whatever. <laughs> the scariest part, yeah. Joe, is that we all have them. Yeah. We're not rejecting them. Mm. We're incorporating so them. So if we don't s have enough uh, symptoms of Morgulans, then we have them, but we don't see them. Yes, oh. think about that. That's we scary. all have them. Mm. Morgulans sim syndrome, I think, is what they're saying now. We used to call mm -hmm. it Morgulans disease. Mm -hmm. I think now they're saying Morgulans syndrome appears to be the people who are actually rejecting the fibers. Mm -hmm. But we're all getting them, okay? okay? Yes. Thanks for telling me. No, I, I, have so. to tell, I have to say these <laughs> oh, things, <man>. yes. <laughs> now, the fibers, like I said, the fibers are uh, uh, micron-sized, but they are also visible to some extent. It was here in Germany. I just saw a small video uh, made by somebody here in Germany who'd gone to Home Depot, I think, and gotten a black light. And at night, um, on a day when it had been clear that there'd been heavy spraying, took the black light out. It was summer, clearly, no wind. You could see there were no trees moving, right? Turned the black light on. The amount of stuff in the air that you could see all of a sudden, it literally so thick, and fly, and this is what we're breathing in, and that's just what we can see. Right. Okay, yeah. the submicron stuff we cannot see. Um, one of the things I do also want to say about uh, the fibers that are getting into our body is that uh, they carry uh, a rep. They carry something called GNA. GNA is um, a synthetic version of DNA. All right. Again, I would like to know what what dropping this micron-sized particle uh, from the sky such that I can breathe it in and it has um, a synthetic DNA, a synthetic sort of DNA has to do with solar warming. Mm. This I would like to know. Yeah, I mean, I really think that um, these are medical experiments. Absolutely. Okay, this GNA, very much like our DNA, responds to frequency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and now we live in an atmosphere that's conducive. It's conductive. You can emit a signal into our atmosphere that creates a frequency, a response from our DNA. And we should be aware that they are sending out via harp or other um, plants around the world. They can send thought forms, they can sense the frequency of a certain disease or whatever. I mean, everything is electromagnetic, and if you have the right frequency, you can make you sick or make everything. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's purely, it has to be purely, well, it's purely from manipulating DNA in some way. It has to be. Mm. The question is why? And yes, we're surrounded by electromagnetic charges. You and I are certainly old enough to remember a time when this really started to avalanche mm. on us. Mm. Um, the Gwen Towers, the microwaves, mm. everything that's television, radio, everything that's mm. in the air, Wi-Fi. Um, I learned recently that normal electromagnetic frequency in a neutral, on a neutral planet is something like 32 megahertz or thir even 32 hertz. And now we live in an environment that is 100% of the time in the millions. Mm. Okay, so we're constantly being bombarded mm. by the electromagnetics. I'm sure it's uh, hertz or volts. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's volt, hertz. Uh, millivolts maybe. 32. Hertz is the frequency. Okay. 32. Okay. okay. It's and now like it's millions. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, but again, the science is irrefutable. It's out there for anybody to look up. Yeah. Dane Wigington is presenting this. Clifford Carnicom is presenting mm. this. 
it's, it's very easy to get a hold of this information. Geoengineering.org is a marvelous site mm -hmm. in the United States where they really try to collect um, little known facts about uh, the geoengineering program. I, I was appalled to learn that we are being invaded by a replica of DNA. I'd like to know why. Yes. What for? Especially when you consider that most, most, at least let's look at the trees, okay? We can at least say that the forests are, are they intend to replicate our forests in an unnatural, unliving way with geoengineering, okay? Mm. I don't want a synthetic DNA in my body. I don't need a synthetic DNA in my body, and I'd like to know what it's there for, okay, if nothing else. So these are, these are the reasons that I think that we're at, a, we're at kind of critical mass right now. I'm a lot more intent about talking about these particular things than I was in January because this is new information for me. Um, yeah, so uh, the, thing, the other thing I would really like to talk about, Joe, is ultimately why they're doing this. I have, uh, I'm pretty convinced, I'm absolutely convinced as I was in January, that the reason that we're seeing so much of this now is because so many of us on this planet as spiritual beings are intent on pulling the darkness up into the light. And so it seems very overwhelming. Um, it's very scary sometimes. But it feels as if we're being avalanched by this information because all of us are sort of intent on bringing this stuff out of the darkness into the light where it can be healed and cured. Not doing that doesn't mean it's not there. It's there in the dark. Mm. We, but we, mm. in order to get rid of it, we have to bring it up into the light. And so when I think about who in the world could be trying, could, could, who in the world could make this their work while they're here on this planet? Mm. I think about us as spiritual beings, as co-creators, because that's absolute, absolutely what we are on this plane. We are co-creators. I, from my cosmology, would call us the 10th hierarchy, just below the angels. But these are our words for spiritual entities. Mm, okay. okay. And we are very close to stepping up, stepping across a threshold that's very, very important yep. as co-creators and as spiritual beings. We're really starting to come into our own in a very significant way. There are beings on this planet that are unable to co-create in a natural way, in a yeah. spiritual way. And when you look at all of the things that they're doing, are they not sort of crippled attempts at creation? Yeah, but like a child that can just destroy the toys and right. that's the only way to express right. it itself or what? Yes, or coming up with fake DNA yeah. You know, you can't yeah. make DNA, so yeah. as a co-creator, mm. a creator would want to be able to come up with a tree. But if you're not, so, if you're not an entity that's a co-creator, you probably won't be able to come up with a tree that's actually alive. Mm. These are the silent forests. Yeah. That's what they're calling them, the, si yeah. the silent forests. Yeah. Um, they are coming up with a lot of things that a spiritual entity who could co-create would be able to do midwife, I guess that's a good term, be able to mm -hmm. midwife um, as a living thing with spirit, mm -hmm. with the ability to regenerate itself. Mm -hmm. We all mm -hmm. used to have a very close uh, relationship with that sort of idea because we all farmed, we all had animals, we were very close to the earth, we mm -hmm. needed to stay in touch with lunar cycles, we needed to stay in touch with the spirit that we lived in. Sure. And we were part of it. We were so a resonant part of that. We've mm. been completely removed from that, yes. disconnected from that process in the 20th century. Yeah. And false things have been put in place of those living mm. items. So we are being manipulated by forces that are intelligent, probably, so, yeah. but they have no heart. And that's the good part, that we have the heart, but we have to use it to turn things around. I mean, we're doing it anyway, but there's a point where we have to say, these things have to stop, otherwise this planet is going down mm -hmm. the gutter. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, if they carry on like that, mm -hmm. and we have mm -hmm. to say that's enough, and you have to stop it. Absolutely, and I think that's actually um, 
I would postulate that that's actually our task here yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. To gather the will to say no. Yeah. To, gather to, to, get, to gather the will, this is an act of will, to say no. You are going to stop. You must stop doing that because I said that you cannot. Yeah. This is a fundamental thought process. Yeah. You know, this is how you become sovereign as a spiritual entity. Yeah. I have said no, you may not. Yeah. Okay? And they count on us being so disconnected and so hypnotized by the, all of the electronics that they've put in our way um, that they've almost eliminated our ability to, to do that. Almost. Yeah. Not quite. Let us talk about the people who are doing this things. I mean, the, there are pilots and there are people who have to work there. And do they know what they are doing? I mean, I had a friend to talk, uh, talk to a pilot from, I, I think it was this, uh, and, and she asked him, do you know about chemtrails? And he says, well, yes, I've heard about it, but actually I am, um, pre on my flights I have to press a certain button once in a while. Um, but it's good for the Earth, it's, it's, it's doing good things. Mm -hmm. So he, was, he knew that he was doing something, but he thought it was for a good cause. And the other thing he said was actually that they put something into the air in the cabin to keep the people in the economy class uh, calm on long flights. So they put something in there. He said that to, to, to a friend wow. of mine. Okay, what are they thinking? You have written about that in your book, and it's... The pilots. I'm, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to say again how brilliantly uh, you have written how they think and what they think and how it works. So it's really good reading, but can you explain but it's well, what are they thinking? Right, it's important. The psychology and the training that we've received as human beings really since the Second World War. And I can, I can point to the fact that my mother is a character in this book and say that she's a prime example of mm. this, okay? 20th century America. She was born in 1936, and this all does go to answer your question. It's a bit long. Mm -hmm. But um, she was born in 1936. What does that mean? Well, it means that she grew up watching newsreels of World War II, yeah. yes, and how America was going to ride to the rescue, and we really were the only thing standing between. Our military was the only thing standing between um, Evil, life uh, and death. Yeah. It was the end of the world and really that was the beginning of this massive, massive brainwashing that went in, on in the United States. Yeah. And I can tell you as well that I'm, well, I'll tell you this, I'm a Waldorf teacher. I stepped away from uh, government education a very, very long time ago when I had children and I saw what it was going to do to them. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that one of the most important components, speaking for my own country in America, is that 230-odd years of history that we have, which is really just a drop in the bucket, isn't mm -hmm. it, in terms of the rest of the world, is give, given to us over and over and over every single year of our lives until we graduate in a very specific way, okay? In my country, not only do we have generations who uh, were taught to admire the military and taught to believe that the military knew exactly what they were doing and had very importantly become a father figure, a parent figure for mm -hmm. us in our country. Mm -hmm. But we have the schools teaching us, continuing to teach that, okay? Mm -hmm. We also have significantly a massive attack on the family. The family has been broken, shattered. Moms have to go to work. Dads have to go to work, mm. okay? And not only that, they're expected to go to work, or women especially are denigrated for mm. not working. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, I certainly was. I stayed home with my children for a long time. So important steps of bonding, bonding to your children is not family. happening anymore. The idea is changing the idea of who's the boss, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Who's the boss, who's the parent? Well, in the United States, let me tell you, uh, the government's done a very good job of making itself the parent, yeah. the boss. Yeah. And so you end up with, uh, with people who don't get any positive reinforcement at home and are definitely looking for a parent figure. Well, the military fills that, fills that void very well, okay? Mm -hmm. um, you have tons of poverty in the same populations, and that's growing in the United States, by the way, by leaps and bounds. Um, they're looking for security. They're looking for an income. They're looking for people. They're looking for rules. They're looking for someone who knows what they're doing to tell them what to do. 
that parent figure, yeah? And so this is the kind of person who becomes, goes into the military and becomes very tellable. Yeah, and he's earning a lot of money earning doing a this, money. like a mm -hmm. half million in a year. And so, but secure. after a while, he, he uh, figures out that money could be gone in a second because the exactly. money is not worth anymore or they send to the IRS and say, where's the money from? It's money Where's laundering. Money from? That's so right. he one day... Uh, That's blackmail potential. Yeah. you got to do what I tell you if I can send you Absolutely. to jail for the rest of your and life. And he figured that out after the while that all the money that he makes is probably not worth what he's doing. Right. Exactly. So there might be an elite force that uh, thinks about uh, population uh, reduction. They want to reduce humankind to a, a very low uh, uh -huh. amount, although that's ridiculous because all humankind would fit into the state of Texas with right, plenty right. of space, you right. know. But they think and they want to control uh, humankind and we are too many. They are afraid of us awakening and we are doing that. And so maybe it's all part of a dark plan to keep us uh, manipulated, mm -hmm. uh, but we have to wake up. Mm -hmm. Well, these are where, this is where you want to throw out, and this is, you can, you can look this up for yourself, and I really encourage you to because it's, it's really important, it's critical. Yeah. Agenda 21, um, Codex Alimentaris, yeah. something people don't know about, mm -hmm. was developed in 1961. Please look that up. Um, Again, though, what this falls under for me, Joe, is one of those areas where we debate and we discuss, and is it real and is it not real, and that has to wait now. That stuff has to wait. Yeah. We don't have any more time to argue yeah. about whether this stuff is real or not. I agree with you. I absolutely think that that's correct, trying to wipe out the people who are co-creators. But right now, we have to put all that away. Yeah and focus on the idea that they're so desperate that they're willing to do things to our atmosphere that can't be allowed, that can't be remediated. We kind of have to wrap it up here. Okay. Uh, so I would, I mean, that's all very dark, but you had some bright uh, aspects in there mm -hmm. also, thankfully. Mm -hmm. And I think we should end with that because um, and I would, how do you see it? We are in a process of going up into the light mm -hmm. and there are forces trying to keep us. Uh, what's happening? Let me tell you what I think. I think that the light is always going to win. Mm. I think that life cannot be denied. And I think that this is just a desperate attempt from a, from a, a negative, dark, esoteric, side of our existence on this planet to both stop us from doing what we do and try to usurp our place as co-creators. And it isn't going to work. It's not working. Thank you, Carlos and Lewis. Thank you, Joe. Thank you.